as we uh, come to God in congregational uh, prayer um, and as we uh, prepare for the offering as well, I just want to remind you, uh, for those of you who are at home, um, you can, of course, always uh, send an e-transfer. You can set up automatic withdrawal, uh, pre-authorized remittance. Um, you can also send uh, checks uh, to uh, Clarence, um, and uh, that information should be available in your bulletin, uh, or you can always call uh, the church or Clarence to find out more details if you need to. Also, um, we want to, of course, um, pray for um, the drawing of names, and we want to pray for uh, President Trump as well and his wife, Melania, uh, with their uh their contraction of COVID-19, um, and uh, yeah, just pray that God will have mercy upon them and uh, heal them, uh, as well as all of those who are struggling with uh, COVID-19 in this world. Let's come before the Lord. Oh, I forgot. I was supposed to say what the offering was for. The offering is for All Nations Heritage Sunday, uh, Rave to Relations. Our denomination... Um, yeah, just like, just like many denominations in this world, uh, we have not been perfect with regards to uh, the relationships between different races. Um, and, uh, and we are trying to do what is good uh, and to learn to uh, bring justice and mercy and love uh, to all the people of this world, regardless of their background. And All Nations Heritage Sunday is a Sunday to uh, celebrate uh, the diversity of this world, God's creativity in creating so many different people with so many different backgrounds. Um, but also it's an opportunity for us to contribute to positive growth and reconciliation among uh, races as well. So I would encourage you to prayerfully uh, consider that in your giving today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for uh, drawing us together this morning. We pray that you will guide us during the rest of this service, that we will hear your voice in the scriptures, just as we have already heard your voice in scriptures and in song, and as we have been here together. Father, would you please, uh, would you please illuminate not only our hearts and minds, but would you also help all people of this earth come to you, O oh God? Lord, may we, the human race, your creation, those who bear your image, may we come, one and all, to your throne, willingly receiving your gift in Jesus Christ and willingly laying down our lives for you, O oh God, just as you in Jesus Christ laid down your life for us. Father, we pray. We pray for this world that is full of turmoil and brokenness. We pray for all those who are hurting right now. We pray for those who are grieving because they have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are grieving because of the hurt in this world. We pray for those who are seeking a better day. Lord, would you bring them true hope? Would we, in your name and through your power, give them new hope in Jesus Christ? Would we, together with all your followers, all your disciples throughout this world, would we proclaim loudly the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Father, we pray that you would guide us a little bit later on as we draw names for elder or for deacon. Uh, Lord, we thank you for those who are willing to serve in both the capacity of elder and deacon. Lord, we pray as well for, um, we pray for David, Lord, we thank you that he is feeling well. We pray for all of those in our congregation who are struggling in some way with health concerns. We ask that you would bless them and heal them. And Lord, would you help us to be an encouragement 
to them as well, O oh God. May we bring healing in your name. Whether that is miraculous healing through the power of your spirit or whether that is the healing of the soul and the emotions and the mind by our presence and our encouragement or however, O oh God, you call us to bring healing, Lord, please help us to do so. We pray that as well for the people of Canada. We ask, O oh God, that this nation, this nation would come to you. Father, once again, we pray for our, uh, our leaders. We pray for the leaders in our health care community. We pray for frontline workers in our health care community and, and elsewhere, oh God. We pray for our educators. We pray for our children. We pray for uh, all of those who are uh, at risk in some way, shape, or form at this time. Lord, we pray for our business leaders, some of whom who are struggling very much financially during this time. We pray for those who have lost work, oh God. We pray for our federal and provincial and regional and local leaders as well. We pray, O oh God, for the Green Party, who have gotten a new leader. We pray that you will bless her in her work, just as, O oh God, we pray that you will bless the leaders of the other federal parties and all the members of Parliament. Father, we pray, too, that you will be with President Trump and his wife, Melania, Lord, we pray that you will bring them healing just as we pray that you will heal all those who have been stricken with COVID-19. And yet, O oh God, we also hold our hands open. In our lives, Lord, we open our hearts and minds to receive whatever you have in store for us. And we trust you, O oh God, that you will do what is good and right, even if we cannot see it. Father, we pray that you will also be with, with all nations, all, all ethnicities, all religious backgrounds, all skin colors, all the beautiful and wonderful diversity of this world, O oh God. We pray that you would help to heal the relations between peoples of different backgrounds. Lord, we pray against hate, and we pray against racism, and we pray against all the evils that would seek to divide your image bearers one from another. Lord, may we be ministers of reconciliation, just as you said, we were called to be. And Father, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds for the, for the sermon that is coming. Would you speak to us through your scriptures and would you speak through me and give me the words to share. May all our hearts be open to hear what you would have us hear. In Jesus' name, This morning, uh, brothers and sisters, we are on part 15. Uh, this is, as Gwyneth was saying to me the other day, this is by far uh, the longest sermon series I've ever preached in my whole entire life. Um, but it, it is so important, it is so critical. Just let me move stuff out of the way so I can wander a little bit. It is so critical for us to know what what. God is like, who God is, so that we can understand a little bit about Him and therefore understand a little bit about us. It's, it's like any kind of relationship. You can't really, you can't really know what your relationship with someone else is unless you know who they are a little bit at least, right? 
I cannot know what my relationship is with my neighbor across the road if I don't know my neighbor across the road at all. I don't know his character. I don't know who he is. I never talk to him. I, I mean, I suppose you can know that you don't have a relationship with your neighbor, but you can't, you can't develop any kind of a relationship, and you can't figure out where you stand in relationship to each other without knowing each other. And so it is with God, except much more so. You cannot know who you are in this world without really knowing on some level who God is. You just can't. At the worst, you may have an incorrect understandings of who God is. There, it's all over television and the media. There's, there's so many different misconceptions about who God is. You know, um, when we think about the Old Testament God, often people think of this wrathful, angry, white-haired dude who sits up on the clouds and says, Thou shalt not. And he's full of anger and righteous judgment. And, and it is true that God does have righteous judgment. But that is not the totality of who God is. Seeing only that in separation from everything else that God is gives you an incomplete picture. Or we see people who, who believe that there's some cosmic force out there that is vague and perhaps uncaring or, or doesn't particularly pay attention to us. Or perhaps you get the idea that there are cosmic scales of good and bad and that it, it all evens out in the end and you've got equal parts and equal powers on either side. And all these things are wrong, or at best, half-truths. And so it is very important for us to understand who God is. Well, today we're focusing on how God is attentive, compassionate, and creative. God is attentive, compassionate, and creative. And I think these are things that we know very much, but at the same time, they are things that that um, we don't always think about in terms of their implications for us and how uh, we are to live uh, and what God's uh, characteristics on this front mean for us. As always, uh, we are really asking the question, who is like the Lord our God? And we are, uh, we are thankful to Karen Sori of the Infographics Bible for allowing us to use this graphic. Once again, we are in the, the sort of quadrant down on the bottom left where we are looking at how God is attentive, compassionate, and creative right near the very bottom there this morning. And in order to look at God's attentive character, we're going to look at Psalm 34. Now, originally, uh, this had us looking at uh, 1 Peter, I believe. But in 1 Peter... Uh, the Apostle Peter quotes Psalm 34. So I thought we would go right to Psalm 34 instead of looking at uh, 1 Peter. And in Psalm 34, I bolded the, the spots where particularly we can see David highlighting God's attentiveness to him. This is a psalm of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech who drove him away and he left. David says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him 
He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. The word of the Lord. Amen. Notice in this passage how often David is talking about how attentive God is to him and to all who are righteous, to all who are calling on the name of the Lord. This goes totally against this idea that somehow God is the cosmic clockmaker who creates the universe, puts all the laws in effect, and then lets it run on without paying attention anymore. That is not our God. We have a personal God. One who cares intimately for every little thing. And who pays attention to even the sparrows, as Jesus Himself says. But we also have a God, not only who is attentive, but we also have a God who is compassionate. So that we don't have a God who's just paying attention and allows us to carry on with all the yuck in our lives. We have a God who is compassionate. This is from Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. In this, um, the prophet Isaiah has just shared with the people of Israel a woe to them because they are choosing to go down to Egypt, which God told them not to do, and seek help from Egypt against their enemies. And God told them, don't go back there. Don't go back to Egypt. You're my people. And so there are woes coming to the people of Israel for stubbornly choosing to go to the, to the Egyptians for political and military help when they should be seeking help from God. But then Isaiah goes on and says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, He will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for Him. People of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious He will be when you cry for help. As soon as He hears, He will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. 
Then you will desecrate your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, Away with you. The word of the Lord. Amen. Our God, our God is for justice and righteousness and holiness, but He is also compassionate. God is, it, it's like God says, okay, you are going to have to face some hard things now. Because you insist on disobeying me. You insist on doing that which is bad for you. You insist on walking away from me. And so you you will have consequences. But I am eager, eagerly waiting for the smallest outcry from you for help. I am longing for you to say, please have mercy, God. And as soon as you do, I'm there. I'm there. I don't know if you remember when you were um, when you had children. If you have uh, if you have had children and they were little tiny, and uh, you had to punish your little tiny child. I can remember giving uh, Kieran when she was quite small timeouts, um, and I can remember how hard it was to put my beautiful little girl in a timeout. It was what she needed. She had behaved badly, but it was hard. I wanted to scoop her up in my arms because she was wailing and crying and oh, right? But she needed it. And as soon as there was repentance, as soon as there was like, I'm sorry, it's like, ah, yes, woo I'm going to rescue my baby girl. It's like God is longing. God is longing for the people to come to Him in any way, shape, or form. But He's not going to force him, more force us to. Right? How gracious He will be when you cry for help. As soon as He hears, He will answer you. He's not like, how gracious I'm going to be because I'm going to force you to accept my forgiveness and whatever. No, no, no. He's going to wait. He's going to be patient. He's going to allow you the freedom to choose to repent. And then as soon as you do, He's there. Of course, not only is our God compassionate and attentive, but our God is creative. I myself um, like to think of myself as a somewhat creative person. And, and so I love... Uh, this passage because it outlines, of course, the, the infinite creativity of our God. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness He called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so God called the vault Sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered the what gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation. Seed-bearing plants. Well, I 
Sorry if I have to do that. Oh, good. Uh, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good and there was morning and there was, there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let, the lights, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number." Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts in the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. The word of the Lord. Amen. God is creative. All we have to do is look around us honestly for a few moments to see God's creativity at work. Even in this building where many of the things are uh, so-called man-made, we can see each other. Every single person here is a unique creation of God all created in His image, all given wonderful gifts that were given by God before the foundation of the world, all knit together in our mother's wombs, all beautiful. Brothers and sisters, our God's brush strokes our genius beyond the greatest Van Gogh or Rembrandt that could ever be. 
Gwyneth and I took a drive just yesterday and drove around looking at the, the leaves, the beautiful colors of the fall. And, and I said, it, it feels like the whole forest is turning into multicolored lace. It's so beautiful. God is creative. Now, what does this mean for us, of course? So God is creative and attentive and compassionate. What does that mean for us? Well, obviously, we can take great comfort in all of these things. We can great, take great comfort in the fact that God is compassionate to us. If He was not compassionate to us, again, just like so many other characteristics of God, we would find ourselves in severe trouble. Not only that, but we can be deeply grateful that God is attentive to us. It may not always feel feel like God is paying attention to us. It may feel like God is far away, but He is not. If we are suffering, then God is right there with us. If we feel alone, we are not, for God is there with us. If we are walking in dark valleys, like Psalm 23 says, we are not alone. For his rod and his staff, they comfort us. We can take comfort in the fact that God is compassionate and attentive. But we can also take great joy and comfort in the reality that God is creative. Notice that one of the characteristics that we that God, we don't talk about with God, is that uh, God is destructive. Because God's not. God's not destructive. There are times when God destroys in order to build new, but ultimately God is creative. He creates. This is one of the great joys of this creation that even though it is bent and broken so much with sin, we can still see God's creative power all around us. The beauty of God's creation shines through even amidst the sin. But also, it is one of our great hopes because we are not going to stay in a broken world forever. The Bible tells us very clearly, clearly that Jesus will return. And He will judge the living and the dead. And He will make all things new. So that there is a new heaven and a new earth where the dwelling of God is with humanity. Our God is created. Our God does not abandon, but instead He recreates. Our God does not destroy. Our God rebuilds. And what does that mean for how we should live? Well, if you notice, back in that passage that we are looking at in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God throughout the Scriptures, and we've mentioned this before, throughout the passage, Genesis chapter 1, where God is creating the universe, God says, let there be this, let there be that, let there be the other thing. God just declares it to be, and it is. Except when it comes to the creation of humanity, where God says, let us create mankind in our image. This is the only time in the creation story where God discusses with someone any part of creation. Let us create God, or let us create, excuse me, mankind in our image. This is very significant. Because this is the place where God discusses within Himself Father, Son, and Holy Spirit saying, let us create humanity in our image. 
And God is saying, let us create human beings to be in relationship with one another. Just as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are in eternal relationship with one another, so too we were created to be in relationship with God and with each other. But also, given the context of the creation story, we were clearly created to be creative. We were created to be creative. The whole of the Genesis chapter 1 story is about God creating, and then God creates us, in His image. We were created to be like Him in creation. Now, we cannot create something completely out of nothing like He can. But there are so many things that we can do. We think of creative problems, or we think of creative solutions to problems we, we create uh, various tools, we create medicines, we create art, we create music, we create so many things. And this is part of God, who God wants us to be. And God also wants us to be attentive to one another. To pay attention to the needs of our fellow believers and to pay attention to the needs of the people around us and to be compassionate. There is so much judgment in this world these days, so much vitriol, so much separation and, and hate. That's not what we're called to. That is not compassion. There are many world leaders with whom I disagree passionately on many things. But I don't get to hate them. I don't get to hate the people who are different than me. I don't get to hate to anyone. Because God has taught me love. And God has taught me compassion. And so God is teaching you and I together. Brothers and sisters, we were created also to be create, creative and attentive and compassionate. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for creating this world, this universe. Thank you so very much for continuing on in being your creative self. Thank you also, O oh God, for paying attention to us. Even though we are so tiny in the scope of this universe, thank you for paying attention to us. And thank you, O oh God, for being compassionate upon us. O oh God, we know that we do not deserve compassion. We are so grateful for it. Help us, O oh God, to also be creative and attentive and compassionate. And help us, O oh God, to do that in your name and in your power alone. In Jesus' name we pray.